And most of us have seen the documentary, I'm sure, um, on his life. And, and uh, when, people, when you bring up the name Ricky Williams, people got a lot, a lot to say, right? Yeah. And one scene they always seem to show is when you were giving interview in the locker room with your helmet on, mm -hmm. and I don't know if you had the little sun visor shield or not, and they kind of made fun of it, but you said there was a reason why you gave interviews with, with your helmets on. Helmet yeah. On. So, you know, when I left college, I had a wonderful experience here at the University of Texas. And I, I assumed that the experience in the NFL would be, would be similar. So when I got to the NFL, it was, it was very different. And I remember I was in training camp my, my rookie year, and after practice, we were going to do an interview. And so it was raining outside, so I had my helmet on to stay dry in the golf cart to, to a covered area to do the interview. And when, as soon as I sat down, before I had a chance to take my helmet off, one of the members in the media said, take your helmet off. And, you know, I, I have a bit of a rebellious streak, so, so I kept it on just, just to, to spite them. And, you know, as I did that, what, what I realized was, as a football player, when they interviewed me, they, they had an idea of who I was as a football player. And the sense that I got is they didn't really care about who was underneath the helmet. So what was the big deal about taking the helmet off? And you talk about how, um when you were at Texas, you're talking to a lot of student athletes now about getting out of the athletic bubble. What, what does that mean? It, and I didn't, I didn't realize it until, until this semester coming back to school and, and looking at things from, you know, from the outside. And while I was in school, I was in the bubble, so I didn't even realize things were going on outside the bubble. And what, what I've noticed is when your whole experience in college is isolated to the, to the football program, a large majority of your decisions are based on their ideas of what they would like you to be doing. And I, I think that limits a student athletes from having uh, more of a, a, the co a collegiate experience. I mean, to me, college is about transforming your life through education. And, and I think when it's only about football, you don't get the full, you don't get full access to the resources, especially at a university like, like Texas. You did two things in your career that I think those of us who are passionate about this kind of work saw as courageous. Number one is when you came out of Texas, you signed with No Limit Sports. Y'all know him as Master P, right? And I was teaching at LSU at the time, and No Limit was headquartered in, in Baton Rouge. So you got criticized a lot for that. Can you, can you speak about that, just yeah. having the courage to sign with a black uh, company? Yeah, so, so the way it went down was, when I was in college, I played minor league baseball, so I was allowed to have a baseball agent, but of course they expected to represent me in football. And so I had this baseball agent and everything was going well. And one day my agent and my mother got into an argument and that basically ended my relationship with the agent. And so now I'm you know, probably gonna be a top five pick and I'm on the market for agents. And, and the whole business of agents to me, it just seemed really dirty, you know, like, like they didn't really care about us. It was all about the money. And so I didn't feel comfortable signing with most of these agents. So I was looking outside the box, you know, to see what else was out there. And I had been in conversations with, uh, with uh, No Limit Sports. And I liked the idea of doing something different, of, of really expanding what I was as an athlete, not to just stay in this little bubble, but to be something bigger. And I saw a great opportunity in, in signing with No Limit Sports. And when it came, I took a lot of flack for it. And then when it came around to signing a contract, one of the reasons I wanted to, to go my own way with an agent is because I wanted to do what I want to do with my contract and not be told what to do. And, and I always have been you know, a very idealistic person. And I would always hear people talk about, about athletes and how they're overpaid and all they care about it is the money. And I wanted to show that there's a different image of an athlete. And so when negotiating my contract, Leland Hardy, my agent, he laid three contracts on the table. He said, this one contract will guarantee that you are the highest paid rookie in the history of the NFL. This one, you'll get the max amount of the signing bonus and the rest of it you'll have to, to earn based on incentives. And the third one was a combination of the two. And I said, I want the max amount. I looked at it as a reward for what I did in college, but everything I make in the, in the NFL, I want to have to earn. And so I signed that contract. And then of course, when it came out, everyone said that my agent did a horrible job, but it was actually my choice. Wow. And the second thing I think you did that was courageous, you know, I think when you left the Dolphins, right? Mm -hmm. And it was funny how 
you got criticized for it. And so there's this idea that, you know, black athletes are supposed to eat, drink, and sleep their sport. And it seemed like they were saying, how dare you leave this perfect world we create for you? So how much money did you leave on the table when you left? I left probably about $15 million on the table when I left. You know, and, and for me, I got to a point where my, so when I was a kid, I decided that I wanted to be somebody in life, and I wasn't sure how I was going to get there. And then I started to notice I had a gift as a football player. So and I, when I was a kid, I was four years old, my mom told me I was going to college, and she told me she wasn't going to be able to pay for it. So I pretty much knew I had to get a, I had to get a scholarship. And at that moment, I knew I was going to get a scholarship. Where and how, I didn't know. So I ended up having a great high school football career. I, I get to Texas, and I'm here to play college football, not thinking about the NFL. I have a great career here, and the next step is, is to go to the NFL. Um, I'm off track now. What was the question? You, le you left all that money on the table, but, but you got Okay, yeah, so I, so I get to the NFL, and like I said, it wasn't the way that I thought it was, and it, and it was at this point in Miami, after leading the NFL in rushing, and coming back, and it just got to the point where I was like, okay, what, what am I doing here? You know, am I trying to prove, prove something? And, and I saw this interesting movie called The Americanization of, of Emily. And basically the point of the movie was, you know, men go to war or men have to do things to prove their masculinity. Mm -hmm. And at this point I realized, okay, I've proven my masculinity, <laughs> so what else is out there? And I, I asked myself some important questions, and one of the questions I asked was, is this what I really want to be doing? And when I asked that question, I was surprised. I was surprised by the awareness that, no, this is not what I want to be doing. So I started to, and it was scary because my whole identity was wrapped, wrapped up in being a football player. And so literally the moment before I called the NFL and retired, I saw my whole life flash in front of me. And I realized, okay, if I don't have football, who am I? And it, it, was, it was scary and it did require courage. And at the same time, when I, when I made that call and made that decision, I felt a huge burden lift off my shoulders and I saw the world in a completely different, different light. Now you talked about going to Australia and you said that when you were in Australia you realized you didn't have a marketable skill. I, I didn't have a skill. So when I, when I left the country uh, after I retired, I, I went to Australia and I found this beautiful piece of land and I wanted to buy the piece of land. But the land was so expensive you had to be a, a, a resident of Australia to buy it. So I went to apply for residency. And part of, the, part of the form was you had to tell them what your skill was. And there was a list, probably about 140 jobs. And I started going down the list, and I'm going down the list, and I'm going down the list. And I get to the bottom, and there's not a, there's not a football player on the list. And at that moment, I realized I don't have a skill. And, and at that moment, I realized, okay, if I want to you know, move forward in my life, I have to go and, and acquire uh, some, some skills. What advice would you give current black student athletes today? What I, okay, in high school or once they're already in college? Because I, I think, you know, we, we, we're talking a lot about the student athletes in college, but to me, the conversation needs to be had much, much earlier because once they're in the institution, they got them. And so, you know, I was fortunate. My mom gave me some great advice. So when I was going into the recruiting process, I made a list of the things that I wanted out of my collegiate experience. I wanted to start as a freshman. It's like, like Dr. Kelly was talking about, I don't think I would have survived a red shirt. I, I know I wouldn't have survived a red shirt year. And so I wanted to start as a freshman. I wanted to go to a big university um, that was right on the verge of, of being great. I was looking at, okay, what can college football do to, to enhance my life? And, and so I came here on a, on a recruiting trip and all my criteria matched. But I, but so I would talk to student athletes before and I'd say, because the way it was taught, I was taught was, okay, not everyone is going to make it to the, to, the, to the NFL or make it to professional sports. So you got to have a plan B. And I, I don't like that idea of a plan B because most of us, we don't want to think about plan B, right? We want, we want plan A. And I think also when you pose education as a plan B, athletes, student athletes tend not to take it very, very important. So, so if, if I was given advice, I would say, Look at the big picture, right? Because I think a lot of us, when we get to college and get a scholarship, and we have three square meals for the first time, we got free shoes, free gear, we made it already. And so, and, and some of us, even when we get to the NFL, once we sign that contract and get that big check, we made it already. But guess what? Life continues. So I would tell them to, to look beyond. You know, look to when you're 50, and, and what would you like to be doing? And once you get a sense of that, 
ask yourself, what information would you like to have when you're 50? And that's what you study in college. Last question, let me open it up. Why do you want to get a PhD in psychology? Or why will you get a PhD in psychology? You know, I've always been the kind of person where I look at stuff and, and, and some things just get me really excited. And so I, I was sitting in class th this semester and, and someone came in and they were talking about the, Mc, the McNair program. And they started talking about going to get a PhD. And, and for me, I was sitting there and I was like, I didn't even consider myself like I could ever do that. And so a couple months go by and I'm looking on the internet and I keep seeing this PhD and I start to get excited about it. And you know, Dr. Williams, I, <laughs> I just like, I like the way, I like the way that sounds. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's something that, that excites me. And, I, and you know, one of the things I also would tell athletes is realize that when you play football at a big college, it opens up a lot of doors for you. So I know in my life there's a lot of doors open and I know that PhD is gonna open even more doors. And, and I've always believed that for my life and my teammates and my friends, the sky's the limit. It's just about are you willing to, to go after your dreams? And, and this is one of my. Okay. Oh, questions from the audience? Mm -hmm. Gerald. <clears throat> Coaches can leave uh, their institution to go to another institution, simply have a school buyout, whatever, whatever uh, buyout clause they have. How do you feel about that restriction, which is ultimately on revenue-producing sports, restriction of freedom to transfer? You know, and to me, this question is similar to the question of whether student athletes should be paid. And, and so my opinion is, it has changed. You know, my, fir my first opinion was I, I didn't believe student athletes should be paid because I think it devalues uh, the college education. And, and looking at it more, you know, the question is how many athletes, student athletes come to big colleges to get an education right. or get a degree. So, you know, I'm not a fan of turning college football into the NFL because I've been in the NFL and I've been in college. And, and I think there's, at least idealistically, there's, there's, there's something about college football that remains pure. Um, and so I, I don't know. I don't know what to do about it. And this idea of, of paying athletes, the other problem is, are you going to educate them on what to do with that money? And so, you know, we talk about student athletes, but we have to remember, these, these kids are 18 years old. And, and, and it's, it's a very important time in their life when they come to college because it's, to, I look, it's a gateway to the rest of their lives. And so I, I think these years in college are extremely formative. And it's, it's important to have some kind of support group and some kind of security to build a foundation to take you to the rest. And I think if you start opening up, you know, that it, it making it easier to transfer and pay in these athletes, I'm not sure that's always going to be in their best interest. Dr. Brown. And Dr. Brown, here at UT, I've talked to you a lot of times, Ricky, and I've enjoyed our conversations, but I was just thinking while you were talking a few minutes ago, and the question that came to mind is, who prompted you? Who laid the foundation in your life so that you would become the critical thinker that you are? Okay, yeah. you mentioned, uh, you talked about your dad and that situation and, and your family structure, and in my life it was a seventh grade teacher. I mean, I, I mean my personality comes out, but she actually lit the, lit the flame. And my question to you was, who lit the flame in your life? Was it your mom or somebody it else? It was my mom. I mean, my mom, she, she like, well, I wasn't allowed to say I don't know. It, that, wasn't a, hmm, that wasn't an option in, in my house. And so she, and, and she preached common sense, you know, and, and I think she, she had a sense of, you know, the struggles I was going to have to go through in my life, and she wanted to arm me with critical thinking and, and curiosity to, to help me navigate through it all, and, you know. Growing up, and this came up a little, a little bit yesterday, you know, I was raised by a single mother, but I look at it as a blessing because I know if my, if my father was around, my parents would have been fighting all the time, my mom would have been stressed out all the time, and, and things would have been much worse for me. So in my situation, you know, the Bible says there's, there's one good man in a thousand, you know? So I think those of us, or those of you who, who have had positive 
you know, fathers in your life. You guys are extremely fortunate. Good morning, Ricky. Uh, Raymond Harrison, Texas A&M University. We won't, um, we won't hold that against you. I hope not, because <laughs> I'm here. Right. right? <laughs> um, but my question is, so you talked about your experience in college, and then you compared it to your experience in the NFL. Uh, but then you went back to say that your experience in college was uh, sheltered, for lack of better terms, in terms of you just everything was revolving around football. Uh, I have a brother who played in the NFL for 15 years, and he told me how structured those days are as well. I mean, he's in that building all day. They don't know what's going on in the outside world. Uh, so my question, I have a two-part question, is really what's the biggest difference between college, your college experience, and the NFL experience? And then the second part is if you could do anything differently in your college experience to develop that and have a dip, better sense of your identity outside of the football player, what would you have done? It's a good question. So I think the main difference between college and the NFL is your support system. And I think in college you have – support for pretty much, at least here, for pretty much everything. If I need something, there's always somebody to call. Um, and you get to the NFL and you don't have it. I mean, it's both in your teammates and the, the outside support group. So in college, you spend a lot of time with your teammates in the dorm, hanging out together at a practice. In the NFL, you, you work together and then you go home and you, and you go your separate way. So it, it's different that way. And, and what I found is there's, you know, because you add the money issue, it adds a whole bunch of problems. Competition between teammates, you know, whether you're fighting for the job or who has the nicest car or whatever. So it adds a whole other element when you get to the NFL. And what, what I would do different, it's, it's an interesting question because if, if I went back and I, and I know what I know now, it, it's a whole other story. But at 18, there were so many things that I had no idea, that I had no idea about. And, and you know, I wish I had someone like Dr. Moore in my life to give me a different voice, because the only voice I heard when I was in college was from my head football coach. So, you know, pretty much was, you know, God in, in my world, and everything revolved around, around that relationship. So I, I would have pursued mentors outside of the football arena. Right. Good morning. Uh, Ricky, earlier you talked about uh, your international experience and how that brought in your perspective. And through working with some athletes here on campus, it doesn't seem like most of them feel like they have the opportunity to study abroad. So do you think that would have been beneficial in your collegiate experience? And how do you think we could motivate more students, uh, football players, to get some international experience while they're in college? Without a doubt, it, it, would, it would help them. So when I was, when I was in college, I didn't, I didn't travel internationally, but I played minor league baseball. So I spent a lot of time in the South, which coming from California, it felt like a different world. <laughs> <laughs> but but I did have I wasn't I don't know how these these football players do it they're literally here the year round in the summers and I was for me I, I was trying to get out of here as soon as I could because I knew I needed some some distance from the game to be to be my best and and when when you look at my career I had a lot of success but the way that I did it was was very different so first of all I wasn't on scholarship because I I was a uh, I played minor league baseball I was drafted by the Phillies so they paid for my school and the other part was I spent my summers playing baseball in my freshman year I spent the whole spring semester play, playing baseball. So, and I had money. I think I, I signed for $175,000. So I, I created a situation where I, I made the college experience work, work for me. Um, and and I, would, I would encourage as many student athletes to, to travel abroad and to study abroad as possible. Because it, it helps you put your life into, into context. When the only thing you're ever around is, is football, you know, it really, really limits what you can be. But Ricky, we talked about some of the guys in the class. They say, well, Dr. Moore, I want to go to China or Cape Town with y'all, but I got to be here to work out. That's because that's what the coach says. And, and really, as a student athlete, it's, you're not really allowed to, to challenge or question the, the head coach without, you know, dire consequences. Good morning, Ricky. Uh, Paul Harris from the University of Virginia. Appreciate you being here. Uh, <clears throat> when Dr. Moore asked you the question about what advice you would give to student athletes, you kind of alluded to there needing to be some advice for even high school students as well. Yes. And prior to entering academia, I was a high school counselor. So my question for you is, if you go back to the high school days, what uh, structural arrangements and, and perhaps even individual interventions at that level 
could have been empowering and perhaps some preventive maintenance along the lines of what we're discussing here today? Well, I think if there was someone to, to guide parents and, and, and student athletes through the recruiting process and, and kind of explain to them what it's all about, I think. So I, I had a chance to, to be an assistant coach at an at a FBS school. Uh, FCS school, excuse me, and so I got to go on the recruiting trail and talk to parents and, and talk to kids, and, and I think the, the biggest mistake I saw kids making and their parents is wanting to go to a big school and not looking at where are they going to fit the most, looking at all their goals, what are their academic goals, what are their athletic goals, and finding a place that, that they fit. Most of them just want to go to a big school but they're not looking at what their experience is going to be like at the school. I mean, the one, one of the things that I preach is, is really looking at, the quality, at your quality of life. Because, you know, you could have all the money in the world, you could have all the things you think you need, but if you, don't, if you can't appreciate and enjoy your life, what, it, what is it worth? Good morning. Uh, my name is Alvin Logan here at the University of Texas. Um, my, my question is, with the pervasiveness of the media today and the image of the black man in America, and the media, have, you haven't dealt with it all your career. What advice would you give to maybe a Jameis Winston or somebody that, that's been in the media with that negative light to kind of recorrect his image and um, really kind of how to deal with the media in today's society? Okay, well, well knowing that he's probably not going to listen to my advice. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it's one of those things where you just have to be exposed to. Um, it, it's so... It's so far out of the way that we were raised and that we are taught things should be. I mean, you know, one of the things about the media, my biggest thing is there's no one to hold them accountable. Right. So they can, they can say whatever they want and they can show an image. And once that image is out there, even if it's incorrect, it's still out there and it affects people's lives in a, in a, in a major way. Uh, you know, it's the advice that was given to me that I didn't take. It was, you know, get an idea of what you want your message to be and no matter what they ask you, you know, give them your message. And I, I finally realized that later. Um, but the, the media, is, media is tough. I, I think you just have to realize what your message is, and, and that's, what you, that's what you give them. Hi, Akila Laster, the University of Oklahoma. Um, I had a question. You mentioned self-identity. Um, what advice would you give to current student athletes who suffer from identity foreclosure to start to develop some self-identity outside of the sport? So I would tell them, spend your off time doing something completely different other than, other than football. I mean, to me, it, it, it took me literally taking a whole year off of football and, and just traveling the world to really get a sense. Because I didn't, I mean, we were in class and I heard Dr. Moore use the term identity foreclosure. And so I went on, on Google and looked it up, and I was like, wow, I, I didn't know there was a term for it, but, but <laughs> that, that's, exactly, that's exactly what it is. And what's also interesting is I remember, you know, creating the identity of, of a football player, and it was because I was, looking for, I was looking for an identity that was substantial. I, I think as, as men, we all want to make our stamp on the world. And I think when you look, when you look on it, okay, what's going to be the easiest way for me to make an impression? For me, it was, it was sports. And, and I heard a lot of people talk about it yesterday. I, I mean, I, I did pretty well in school, but that, I mean, that didn't, that didn't do much for me as a kid. But I saw once I go on the football field and I can run fast and score touchdowns, I had people's attention. And I think the mistake is we don't ask, okay, what is it we'd like to do with that attention? Mm. Wow. Because yeah. okay. if you don't know what to do with it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to burn you up. Morning, um, Joel May from Texas a &M. Um, Ricky, listening to your stories and sort of um, what you're talking about, it sounds like you're very uh, intent on making your own decisions, and um, that's respectable, but it's not always easy. So where would you say you faced your biggest challenge was it within yourself, family, peers, institutions? What was your biggest challenge in sort of making your own path? So I think it's the, like the institutions. I think when you, you have an institution like the NFL, it, it's so big. And, that you, you get lost. I mean, when, when you're looking at making life, life choices and you're saying, okay, I might have to turn down the NFL, which is for so many, for so many young boys, it's their, it's their dream, to look that in the face and, and to walk away was, was extremely, extremely difficult. And, and I think also is just dealing with, with the opinion of other people. And I think just a, a regular person working at 7-Eleven has to deal with their family members and, and their friends and, and their friends' opinions. And I think when you're 
when you're famous and you're in the public public eye, there are so many more people's opinions you have you have to deal with, and everything everything is amplified. And, and you know the the positive side about that is I'm at a point now in life where I, I don't think there's anything in life that I can't that I can't deal with. The negative side is it was it was difficult. It was difficult, and it took a lot of perseverance to not quit and, and to keep on going. I mean, there was one point where literally everyone in my life thought I had lost my mind. Hmm. Everyone thought I had lost my mind. To walk away from the NFL and, and just leave. And, and so to, you know, it was my faith. And I just kept, I kept on going knowing that at the end something, something things would, would turn around. This will be our last question from the audience. Uh, I'm sure Ricky will be around um, during more of the conference if you'd like to chat with him, so. Hi, Ricky, Kate O'Brien from DePaul University. What advice would you give academic advisors and other athletic administrators on best supporting student athletes? Well, the, the, the first thing is, is I, I think the academic piece for the athletics should be handled by a different, a different group, not, not the coaches, not sports. Uh, you know, I, I think there should be someone else on campus that handles academics. And so it's, when academics is so closely tied to, to football, I think it, it really forces you to, to, stay in that, to stay in that bubble. So I, I think because the academic advisors, a lot of them answer to the football staff, I mean, what advice, what advice can, you, can you give them? You know. I actually have one last question from one of our future Q&A panelists. Maurice Claret, Ricky Guillaume's biggest fan. <laughs> 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 no, I looked at this guy growing up, so this is, uh, this is real cool to me. Uh, even throughout my trouble, I identified with you, and I really looked to you for strength. I get excited every time I see you. Uh, but what, um, what impact did the absence of your father have uh, on you from you know, coming up and, and not really being there? And, uh, Understand, or understanding that you know uh, that plays a role in a lot of guys, a lot of young guys' development. Well, I, I think the the biggest role is that I I didn't allow it to be an excuse. Um, and, and again, I mean, the my mother I had was really more like a more like a father in, in the the way that she that she raised me. So the biggest thing is I didn't allow it to be an excuse. And the other positive of not having a, a father around is my mom. She went she went back to school after my parents divorced. And so she worked all day and was at school at night. So I was pretty much with my sisters. We were by ourselves. So a lot of you know becoming a critical thinker was there was no one there to ask anything. So I had to figure out a lot of a lot of things on my own. All right. Thank you very much. Let's give Ricky a hand. Thank you.